very, very much for coming. I really appreciate such a friendly audience. Um, this is my first book, first published book, and my first book signing. So uh, you are definitely my guinea pig audience. <laughs> um, and I appreciate you coming. Uh, this is a difficult topic. And most of us have had difficult challenges in our lives. And we just have to learn to cope. And this, our, our, one of our challenges was John's cancer journey. But I have to say that through the process of this journey, uh, we grew closer. We had been married for about 36 years when he was diagnosed. And initially, when he was diagnosed, we were told he had, and John was insistent that he find out how much time the doctor thought he had. And the doctor said, I really don't like to give people um, prognosis like that, because it's an average, and you just don't know. John said, I'm a planner. I have to know. I want to know much, how much time I have so that I can live as much of my life as I possibly can. He said, well, I think you probably have six months to a year, because it, it was metastatic melanoma, um, stage four, which meant nothing to me when I started. And um, so he said, OK, I'm going to beat that. We never told the kids that that was the prognosis at the outset. We were very honest with them otherwise, but, and we knew that they could probably look it up on the internet, but we just decided we were going to beat it. And once we beat it, then we'd start talking more honestly about what the prognosis had been. So with that introduction, my, I, my hope is that the takeaway for you tonight is that um, you make the most of every single day. None of us knows how much time we have. And I remember when John was going into Tufts Medical Center for his first evaluation, we were walking along the street and this guy ran, practically ran into us. And I said, see, we could die right here in the street. You know, <laughs> who knows? So um, that was the attitude that we took and, and made the most of every day. The other thing is that even, you can, even though you can get very depressed, you can choose your attitude. And you can always choose your attitude. And sometimes the choices aren't what you would like, but they are choices that you can make. And um, we chose to face this head on and that we were going to embrace whatever time we had. We knew it was going to be our retirement years together. There are no coincidences, and that's another takeaway. I, I can't tell you how many times different things happened that I said, there's God is talking to us and saying, I'm watching out for you, and things are going to be OK. Tonight's program is a series of slides that I've put together of some of the very happy memories that we made as a family all during the time that he was being treated. Um, as I said, this is my first book signing. So I'm, I, what I tried to do is give you some of the highlights of the travel that we were able to do, which we were very fortunate to do. And some of the um, others are uh, family photos of different incidences that I wrote about in the book. And I'd like to expand on those a bit. This, for, I know many of you have not read the book, so I'll just explain the way the book was, how the book evolved was John, um, as I said, had been sick for five years. And I couldn't possibly connect with all of the people who wanted to know how he was doing as treatments were going on. So I started to write emails to our family and friends. And those emails got spread further and further and further. And over the course of those five years, people said to me, Margaret, these are just so positive and uplifting. You really should put them together and into a book. And I said, I don't know that I can do that. But finally, what I found was that it helped me to cope with his death. It was a way to process my grieving. So it took me a good four years. There were a lot of incidences that occurred over those four years. But then finally, in May of 2017, I approached a publisher. And she worked with me with an editor. And I was able to publish this book on May 15th, his fifth anniversary. So that was my goal. Um, so the structure of the book is the contemporaneously written emails and um, letters that we wrote to our family and friends. And then in addition to that, I wanted people to get to know John. He always wanted to write in his retirement, and he didn't get a chance to retire. So I took the letters that he wrote to his staff while he served as superintendent here in Whitman Hanson, and then when he went over to Spelman. Um, and then in addition, 
the part that I worked the hardest on um, this past year was the narrative to tell the background of the, uh, the context of the story. So I wanted to introduce you to our, my, whoops, my co-author. All right, is this going to not cooperate with me? Next. All right, Joel. <laughs> is it? I just hit the. Next. What'd you hit? I just the you roll? have to go on this and then click. Yeah, that's all you're doing. But now we're backwards. So. All right, just don't. I got it. You got. It. So what? What am I hit? This. You do it. I'll look at you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you want to stand? No, you can sit there. Oh. In the corner. <laughs> Do you want a book? <laughs> I thought I had it all figured out, but you know, that's the way it goes. So anyway, John was superintendent here in Whitman Hanson for, from 2001 until 2009. And um, our story actually began in 2008 um, when he was additionally, um, when he, we noticed that he had like a white fatty tumor on his head. It was not a dark mole, it wasn't anything like that. He was not a sun worshiper at all. Um, so we noticed it. He didn't do really anything about it. I said, you really ought to have that checked out. Long story short, he finally, um, we were on a, um, we, we had a celebration, really, of my birthday during that winter. Um, I'm a leap year baby, and so uh, my birthday only comes every four years, so we make a big deal of it <laughs> um, when we, um, Okay, uh, when we do celebrate my birthday. So John loves Disney World. Anyone who knew him knows that. And he spent as much time down there as he possibly could. I th and we were invited to be the Grand Marshals at the Walt Disney World Parade. I thought John was just going to keel over. He was <laughs> so excited. Um, he just absolutely loved that entire experience. What I didn't know was later that week, he had planned with my daughters and my son um, a birthday retirement party celebration. And so, okay, the, um, the next picture is of all of us. When Chris surprised me, he lived in Charlotte, North Carolina for eight years. And he had called me that day and said, Mom, I'm really sorry. I can't make it home for your birthday. They were going out to dinner. That's what I expected. And he said, I can't make it home for your birthday. I said, that's all right. It's okay. And he surprised me at the venue and showed up. And then I walked in, and there's a whole room full of people. So that was pretty spectacular. Well, you know, <laughs> you know when things are going that well, you say, so when's the shoe going to drop? <laughs> um, so the fatty tumor, we went to Hawaii that spring. And we noticed that the fatty tumor was, that's OK, the fatty tumor was um, uh, bleeding. And I said, this is not good. Long story short, he went to a dermatologist. The dermatologist did a biopsy. He determined that he had melanoma. We thought that if they just excised that site, that he would be OK. So he had the site excised um, at Tufts Medical Center. Wonderful surgeon there. He referred us to our oncologist over at Mass General, who was this Dr. Lawrence, who had been recommended to us before. So we did go to. Um, have, he had the tumor removed, and he ended up going to um, um, Mass General that summer to be evaluated by Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence said, it's typical when you've had surgery. We don't do anything for six to eight weeks at least. So I want you to come back. We'll do some evaluation. And then in September, we will have you come in, and we will be able to um, start any kind of treatment that the, we think might work. And at the time, they really thought that they had caught it. We had been told by the surgeon and by Dr. Lawrence that summer, there was a 50% chance that the, the, the cancer had already metastasized. But you always hope. And um, so we decided that we were going to just enjoy that summer, take the time that we had. Uh, we had already planned another trip to Disney um, to be with my grandchildren and my other daughter and her uh, family and Julie. And we had a very nice trip, but that Tuesday after Labor Day, we had to go into Mass General. And the doctor told us he wanted us to go on to this um, interferon, which was supposed to have sort of interrupted the growth of any additional cancer. 
Unfortunately, after two weeks of going in every single day, uh, we found out that the cancer had, um, had already spread. So he ended up um, having to go to um, radiation treatments, and then he was offered an opportunity to go on to a clinical trial. The doctor said the clinical trials are not always readily available, and so I recommend that you might consider it if you qualify. The other opportunity might be to go into, um, into leukin treatments, which is a pretty rough treatment, which I will talk about. So um, that, was, that was the 2008 to 2009. And 2009, in January of 2009, he had scans after he had had the treatment, and we found out that that clinical trial had not worked. Doctor said, okay, we're going to go and we're going to take out the big guns. We're going to have you take the interleukin-2 treatments. We overheard a nurse saying, two nurses were talking right in front of us and said, if we had to face interleukin-2, we would not do it. It's just that rough a treatment. John said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to beat this. And so he went through the interleukin-2 treatments in February. Contemporaneously, he um, had planned a trip to China for the students and, uh, well, actually it was for adults to go. He was a huge believer in um, global education. And he felt if he could get the community to support global education by visiting China, then they would endorse the idea of introducing more Chinese studies and so forth. So he had, uh, we thought we might get 12 or 13, 14 people to go on the trip. 74 people signed up to go on the trip to China. Well. Needless to say, it was pretty overwhelming to think of him leading a trip to China, mm -hmm. in addition to having gone through this very difficult treatment. So we went through the whole thing, and um, the doctor just kept saying, John, you're going to go, you're going to go. And John said, look at doctor, you don't owe me a trip to China. <laughs> it's fine. And he said, no, you've gone through so much so far, I really want you to get on this trip. Well, three weeks before we were supposed to leave for this trip to China, John couldn't climb the flight of stairs at Whitman Hanson. There was just no way. He used to have to take the elevator. And I, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, what's he doing? And um, three weeks later, oh, well, that's Max. Oh, this was an interesting coincidence, and I, don't, I said I don't believe in coincidences. The morning that our third grandson was born was September 15, 2008. That's not when he was first born. Um, was the day that John was told that he had metastatic melanoma and that he had six months to a year. There's highs and lows in this trip. <laughs> and this was a very high day at the beginning and a disappointing day in the end. But you know, it's one of those things that you say, God gave me this grandchild. I'm going to enjoy him for however many years I can have him. So then <laughs> he got to the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Isn't that, I just loved this picture of him standing there. That was such a typical pose for him, standing there in front of the toilet sign, you know? I mean, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, he got to the Great Wall and um, managed to actually, three weeks after he couldn't climb a flight of stairs, he got up on the Great Wall of China. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, he was just determined. People on that trip, and Megan was with us, people on the trip, Corinne, people on the trip didn't even know that he was as sick as he was um, because he just didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want cancer to define him as a person. So we have one more slide, I think, of China. So, oops, um, the Hutong. That's like a, a home in Beijing, and this was the picture that was in the book. Um, anyway, so that was a wonderful trip. We had wonderful memories and people were really enthusiastic about the whole process of visiting and learning about China and um, it, it, it just was amazing. So um, we're going to stay on that slide for a while. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so the good thing about the interleukin-2 treatment that he had in February of 2009 was that he had outstanding results. He had a 40% reduction in his tumors, um, which was phenomenal. And um, that was the good news. The bad news was that because he had this reduction, um, I think there are a few more seats. If, oh, there's one right here, Mary. Um, 
there, um, because he had this reduction, it would mean that we'd have to go back in and have another whole series of interleukin-2 treatments. Interleukin-2 means you're in the hospital for five days, hooked up to all kinds of machines because you can't, you have to be evaluated the entire time. You then um, are sent home for a week to recover, and then you get the opportunity to go back and go through another whole series of treatments. It's totally debilitating. So he was pretty sick, and this was what he had just come from when we made that trip to China. So we were going to have to head back into um, a second set of, of um, treatments, which was pretty overwhelming to us. But John, being John, he had told Whitman Hansen in 2008 that he wanted to retire in 2009. So he had planned that, and this was before he knew he had cancer. Um, so he was planning to retire in 2009, and he um, was going to start a new job. He had been offered on May 8th, which was the day in 2008 that we were, he originally had his doctor's appointment. He was asked if he would consider becoming the president, the first lay president over at Cardinal Spellman High School. Cardinal Spellman was a school that he graduated from. It's where we met. I didn't graduate. I was a Spellman dropout. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, um, Graduated from there, and the nuns had been extraordinarily kind to him. He came from a very dysfunctional family, and they just filled in a huge void for him. He always wanted to give back. So he was serving on the board um, at Spellman, and he thought that was the way he was giving back. But they asked him if he would consider becoming president. And um, he said, you know, he, once he found out that he had the cancer, he said, look, I'm damaged goods. I, I'm, I'm not going to hold you to the agreement that we had. I'd like to think that I could do it, but I just don't know how much time I have. And they said, we want you, and we want you to work as much as you want to work. We have no vacation time, no sick time. You do what you want to do, and we know you'll get the job done. So he was working <laughs> full time. Um, but that summer, he left Whitman Hanson, and this is no lie, we left his office for the last time at Whitman Hanson, and he uh, we drove directly from there to the Westwood train station and went down to New York City because he was going to have to face the second round of interleukin treatments when he came back before he started the job at Whitman at Spellman. And he said, I'm not going to have to think about this all weekend long. So he did what he always does. He goes on a trip. <laughs> and I go with him. <laughs> so that was very fortunate um, that we were able to do as much travel as we did do. Um, so. After the interleukin treatments that summer, it didn't work out as well. It was disappointing, and we were told we might have two options, and I won't go into that too much, but the, the point was that we were coming home thinking, well, we don't know what's going to happen going forward. Um, we were hoping that he was going to be able to have this treatment called BRAF, targeted cell therapy. He didn't qualify, so we were very disappointed, but the doctor had a little glint in his eye, and he said, but we just got a brand new clinical trial and it just came out last week and I think you're a good candidate for it. So that was our introduction to MDX 1106 and I'll tell you it was the best two and a half, three years that we had to, during this entire time. He had very few side effects, he um, was able to function over at Spellman as president. I mean we're going in once, twice a week still for treatments but I mean, he, I would drive so that he could do work on his emails, he would write letters. I mean, there's whole stories about this in the book. But it was something that kept him going. He really felt as though this was a positive thing for him to be working through with the job. Um, so the summer of 2009, um, we decided, let me see. We're here, so we showed the center, the Greece trips. Okay, go ahead. You can show those. So this was Santorini. Um, this was a promise he had made uh, when we got married. He said we're going to go to Greece. I said, John, I know we don't have the money to go to Greece. We went to the play Greece in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit more fitting. <laughs> Take your time. So 37, and um, I had a um, double wedding ceremony. My sister and I got married together, and so she had also wanted to go to Greece. So we ended up, um, the two couples went to Greece in the September of 2009. 
which was fabulous. Um, we went to Athens and we went to, did a cruise around the Greek islands and then we ended up staying in Santorini. Um, there's one more slide of Santorini. Um, so you can stay on that for a bit. Notice he's got the Boston Red Sox hat, which if anybody ever approached him and asked him anything about the Boston Red Sox, he oh. was done in. He just didn't know. But, you know. So that was the fall of, of um, 2009. So we decided then that we needed to be planning another family trip um, because, again, he just didn't know how much time he had. And he decided to do this while he was having the interleukin treatments. So we planned to bring all the kids and their families to Disney, surprise, um, and go on a Disney cruise. The interesting story about that was that, um, I think I have the next slide, is, um, the interesting thing about that was we, you can show this two or three pictures now. It was the family photo of however many we had at that time. <laughs> and then um, you can hold on that one. Um, so this was the, the trip that he really wanted to take. And he, we had, he hadn't, I don't think he had ever been on a cruise. Several of the kids had not been on a cruise. So we wanted it just to be the shot cruise. So the cast member who checked us in on the boat said to him, are you celebrating anything in particular, an anniversary, a birthday? He said, I'm celebrating life. Aww. And the woman said to him, and so am I. I just came back today from my cancer treatments, and they were successful. Don't tell me that's a coincidence, yeah. you know? It was really, he was so moved. He wore that badge the entire time on that trip. <laughs> so. 2009, 2010 were pretty spectacular for us. I mean, we almost got to the point where you kind of forget that he had cancer. I mean, we are going in and out of the hospital all the time, but the fact was he was feeling good and he could work and life goes on and you just do what you can do. So um, we went down to Charlotte to visit with Chris and Liz um, uh, when we could. Um, but this was his first year at Spelman, remember. So you're adjusting to a new job. You've got these treatments. It's, it was interesting. Um, in the spring of 2010, we took our first trip to Yellowstone and Mount Rushmore and the Grand Tetons. That was a wonderful trip. And he really wanted to celebrate the first good results that we had after the MDX 1106 was started, because it took six months for it to kick in. And we were told that it could take that long. So he was so excited that he said, oh, we've got to go on a trip. So we did. Um, and surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, and as I said, we just kind of went along with whatever we could do when we could do it. Um, that fall, I think there's another slide of the Grand Tetons. Sorry, yeah. And then that fall, we decided that we would go down and visit Chris and his family. Oh, no, actually, we met them in um, Universal Studios. Mm -hmm because um, that was when the Harry Potter ride opened. And of course, John had to go on the uh, Harry Potter ride. And had, we had to get there a day before it opened, so that it, before they were coming, so that we'd be sure to get on this ride. Anyway, then there's a, the next one. <laughs> he just, he wasn't going to let Max ride on that carousel without him. He was just going to have a grand old time. So we had. Um, an exciting year that year. This is now um, moving over into 2011. We were expecting our um, fourth grandchild. Um, Julie was going to be getting married. And um, we were planning a trip to the Canadian Rockies. I mean, if there's a spring, there's a trip. <laughs> so this was the Bouchard Gardens that my mother spoke of frequently and just raved about. So I definitely wanted to see that. And then we had, I think there's one, uh, the Athabasca yeah, Glacier, um, which was just phenomenal. So these things were all um, goals of ours that we want, these were trips that we had wanted to take. But later that spring, we, have in, we knew of the birth of our fourth grandchild, Trenton, and he was born um, in June. And Julie's wedding was planned for July. So the family didn't come up. So he's a little bit, I mean, he's a big guy, but he was, <laughs> he was probably about four weeks old or so, maybe. Yeah, they was a month about old. a month old when they arrived. And um, 
Liz was in the wedding, and of course her big thing was, was she going to get into her dress for the wedding? So then the next picture is of Julie's wedding, and this was a very special day for all of us because John didn't know if he'd ever live to see this. And um, he had promised Julie on an earlier trip to Hawaii that someday they would dance to the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow and um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow and oh, It's a Wonderful World by Iz. And they were able to do that that day. And so it was a very emotional day for all of us. Um, it was huge. So this is right here, Whitman here. Oh, boy, those things didn't come out well. I don't know what's happened there. Um, this is um, right here at Holy Ghost Church. So then later that summer, not to be out, uh, done, we went to, on a trip to Rome and the Amalfi Coast. <laughs> so, I mean, this was a man who was going to enjoy his retirement, come hell or high water, and <laughs> he did. Uh, so we went to Rome and the Amalfi Coast. There's another one there. Um, and we went to, we were in and out of the hospital once, twice a week. Um, he worked it out to be able to um, do what he had to do there. And then um, we had family get-togethers. We had, no, <laughs> we had family get-togethers. And it was just a wonderful time for the whole family. We had a, um, again, I, I, we kind of felt like we were in a honeymoon period. Even though he was being treated, it was, you kind of forgot that he was dealing with serious cancer. So that winter in 2012, uh, of course, one more trip to Disney. Uh, oh, that's Capri. That's, yeah, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, he had certain places that he really liked to go to. And, um, and having picture with the characters was always one of his top favorites. Um, but in the meantime, we can go to the next one. This was the trip to um, Bush Gardens. We had decided we'd rent a house down at the Outer Banks. And in the Outer Banks, um, we had, I don't know, it's like an eight bedroom house, and my sister's family came, and it was just a wonderful time. And on our way down, um, we stopped at Bush Gardens. Well, this is my granddaughter, Kara, who was. Well, let's see, she would have been about four years old, three or four years old at the time. And the previous fall, my mother had passed away. And I said to her when I saw her in that sundress, I said, oh, Kira, my mother would have loved that sundress. It's just beautiful. And she said, I know, Grammy, but sadly, she died. <laughs> and I said, yeah. She said, but don't worry, you'll be with her soon. <laughs> your paws. <laughs> She's 11 years old now and her mother recently told her that story and she goes, oh Grammy, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so um, this was, um, this is Maxwell and Trent um, with John reading books. And then one of the big things was that we wanted to have a family photo done once again. And we, some of the kids are not always cooperative about taking <laughs> pictures. And so the, we decided that we would have a photo taken on the beach. Well, it was the windiest day. You can see all of our hair is like, we look like crazy people. We're blowing and blowing, but we told, this next slide, the, we told the guy in the middle, Zachary, who was really the most reluctant of the children as far as pictures were taken, that if he was good, we would stop at the Lincoln Memorial on our way back home because this was a goal of his. He wanted to see the Lincoln Memorial. He had read a book about Lincoln. He thought that he was the most wonderful <coughs> president ever and he really wanted to see this memorial. So we know Soner took this picture and we said, he said, are we done? And he, I, we said, yes, we're done. He ran over to John and he said, Grandpa, was I good enough? <laughs> and he said, yes, Zachary, you were good enough. So we did stop at the Lincoln Memorial on our way home. But what we didn't know was that after 9-11, there are all kinds of barriers that are put around all the memorials and you can't get close. And John was um, not really walking very well. I mean, he would tire easily. So we had to bring him um, close as we could. Well, we drove around and we drove around. We said, this is just not going to happen. We said, Zachary, we're really sorry. It just doesn't seem like we're going to be able to get close enough for you to get out to actually see it. 
No sooner did that we say that that a van pulled out very close to where the Lincoln Memorial was. We pulled in, and our, we got, and he was able to run up those stairs. And he's standing at the top of the stairs. Of course, he's got this brochure, right? But he's standing at the top of the stairs. He's going like this. And John finally caught up with him, and he says, Zach, what are you doing? He said, I'm pinching myself. I can't believe I'm really here. Of course, John's got tears in his eyes. He was so excited. So. Isn't that a neat? <laughs> so then the next picture is of just Zach. <laughs> he was just thrilled that we actually made it. Um, so that was the family trip. So now we've got the spring summer. So <laughs> John really wanted to go to the Baltic. And I said, really, John? I said, and at this point in time, you know you're we're waging against the odds here that things are going to continue to go as well as they had been. And he was now off of MDX 1106 because the whole idea behind that was that you, you were treated for two and a half years and then you come off of it and you're, it's supposed to have um, triggered your immune system so that you don't create any additional cancer cells. Well, he ended up, um, that was the spring that uh, we started to see some symptoms and it was on this next trip and I won't spend a lot of time with this but we ended up going to um, 11 countries in 14 days but let me tell you that the way to do that is to be on a boat because you are not packing and unpacking it's like one of the river cruises I mean it's just wonderful um, you can take the trips you don't have to take the trips you can get in and on and off the boat do as much or as little as you want it really worked out to be a great alternative method for us so um, there's a whole series of slides he really wanted to see this Peter Hoff in St. Petersburg oh, there's another one um, this is the uh, Peter Hoff pavilion of the Russian Tsarinas it's sort of a um, late night uh, early 19th century home that the family really preferred and all of the furniture is still in this home and we actually did a tour of that little hu little cottage. Uh, we went to Bruges, Belgium. He purchased a, uh, I have a whole collection of um, nativity sets and he had to have one more um, from Belgium. And then I think there's one more slide, yeah, of the strip. During this trip, we realized that his vision, he was having a little trouble with his vision, and we got a little alarmed. But <laughs> then the other problem that he was having was an intermittent sore throat. And I said, eh, I don't know. But I said, Let, we've got to enjoy the moment, and we'll talk to the doctor about it afterwards. The fact that the sore throat was coming and going, the doctor felt perhaps it was just, you know, the, the water, air quality on the ship, whatever. But after some careful evaluation, he was referred to an eye doctor at um, Mass Eye and Ear. And um, actually, the eye problem that he had, oh, by the way, he had diabetes. So um, <laughs> he, um, it, was, it, it was an interference of the diabetes, a complication of diabetes, as far as the eyesight was concerned. But it was determined that the treatment that he would need for that was going to conflict with his treatment that he needed in order to continue on for the cancer treatments. Because at this point, he's now on what they called ipilimumab, which um, was, a, was related to the MDX-1106 that had been such a successful treatment for him. But it was a very um, rough treatment. And, um, but they wanted to keep him on it to see if we couldn't keep him alive longer. And so we ended up, um, he ended up having to have a tonsillectomy. And as an adult, with, because the cancer was in his tonsils, as an adult, that's a tough surgery. Um, and as an adult with cancer who's having cancer treatments, it's an even tougher surgery. So he ended up um, having a tough time recovering from that. And oh, he needed one more trip to Hawaii. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> OK. I said, really, John? Oh, we celebrated his birthday that summer, of course. Um, so that was uh, after the Baltic cruise and everything. But, he ended up having to, um, uh, we, we had to go, oh, when we went down to, se in September, we went down, my son arrived, um, and we had gone down to see the Book of Mormon in New York City, and we met Chris and his family, and so we saw it one night, they saw it the other night, and in the meantime, we brought Max and his little brother over to the Intrepid, and this little Challenger that he has right there, this, it's not the Challenger, it's the Enterprise, was a little, little plastic spacecraft that, he really liked, and John said, oh, I'll get that for him. Max still has it in his room, and he knows that Grandpa gave it to him. So that was pretty special. 
So then next one was, yes, we did make it to Hawaii. Um, and in the book it tells you that when we got there, there was a tsunami. And <laughs> we had left a hurricane in New England to go to a tsunami in Hawaii. But we were there, and there's a few more pictures. And the Waimea Canyon, which is like the Grand Canyon of, of you can stop it. It's the Grand Canyon of Hawaii. And we were going with high school friends of ours. So I think that was kind of what spurred him on to want to go. I don't know. He just said, if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? I said, I don't know, but we don't need to. <laughs> um, but he really didn't seem to bounce back is the way I would have expected. That December, December 12, uh, 2012, we, we had a Christmas party at our house. Chris and his family were coming up to go to a wedding, and so we had an early Christmas celebration. So we invited our friend of Julie's, who was our Santa Claus, um, who came to the house. And we had all the grandkids and my sister's grandkids, and, and uh, we gave each of the kids a book and all of that. And the strange thing is, and I mentioned this in the, story, in the book, about he, Trent was only 18 months old when we had this Christmas party. And about two and a half years later, he said to me, Grammy, Santa Claus sat in that yellow chair in your house. I said, what did you say, Trent? So he's now like four, three, four. And he said, Santa Claus sat in that chair. And I said, Trent? He said, and Grandpa was there too. Oh, wow. And I went, whoa. <laughs> you don't know what a kid knows. Yeah. You yeah. just don't know what they're retaining. Um, so anyway, and the kids do remember the book that they got from Santa that year, because they'll show it to me at Christmas time. Um, things started to turn for the worse. Uh, in January, uh, I was forced to bring John in to Mass General on an emergency basis, and he ended up having to have um, emergency bowel surgery, and he ended up having a colostomy. And that really was difficult for him. He just really didn't like the idea of having a colostomy. And um, there's more detail about that in the book. But it really was a, it was a tough time for him. And uh, I said, it just means you're going to live longer. They told us it was going to be temporary. If um, he could stabilize, then they would reverse it. So he looked forward to that day that they were going to reverse it. But then in um, uh, the date, I'll never forget, it was April 2nd. And uh, they told him that they couldn't. He was just too weak. He was really down about that. I said, John, you've told me before. We're going to take advantage of the time we've got, and we're not going to look back. So we um, had the great privilege then of having our fifth grandchild born in April of 2013, which is Julie's oldest boy, um, Benjamin. And he uh, dragged himself into the hospital. He had been at the hospital that day. They let us out early, dragged him into the hospital. I said, you could take the wheelchair up to her room. He said, no, I'm walking into that room. I said, so I'll bring you in the wheelchair. You can get out of the wheelchair and walk into the room. <laughs> nope, I'm not doing it. So he walked all the way up there, walked in, and just when he came into the room, of course, he's very spry, and he's smiling, and got a hold of that baby, and all the cares went away. And five weeks later, um, we had to go back into the hospital, and he um, had really deteriorated. And I just thought, he's, you know, he's just not stable. And he, he didn't last very long in, with that hospitalization. So the Mother's Day, we all happened to be home for, for Mother's Day that year. Chris had come up from North Carolina. He had planned, because he knew that John's health was failing, he planned to come up and stay for two weeks. He had gotten a house in Situate. And fortunately, he was already here. And so John's big goal then, after seeing Benjamin born, was um, to live through graduation at Spelman. That was his goal. And um, that didn't happen. He died the week before. But by golly, he died at 2 o'clock in the afternoon by the time school got out because he didn't want anything to show that he was, you know, taking any thunder. So the next picture is actually an older picture of him, but it was taken at the Whitman Town meeting, and I just thought it was kind of funny because I'm here in Whitman, and I just loved this picture because I thought it just captured the sparkle in his eye. Um, and it was just a neat picture, and um, so it was taken by Whitman Hanson Express, I believe. Um, 
So we then, of course, had to plan his funeral services and so forth. And I was going to end the book there, and then I said, no, you know, our life has continued on. And we have tried to find ways that we could find joy in the way that we lived our life together. And he would expect nothing less of us than to try to find joy as we continue forward, going forward. So that summer, we had planned to go to Vermont, to our favorite place, the Trapp Family Lodge. And um, there were six rainbows that week. And the kids kept saying, Grandpa's painting the sky for us. Grandpa's painting the sky. I mean, it was just exquisite. So that was in that summer, which was tough, because that was the first vacation we had taken without him. And everybody missed him. Um, but you know, it was one of those things you said, you know, you're just going to keep looking for those signs. And so then the um, next one is the most recent picture. And this is Benjamin now. <laughs> Benjamin is a five-year-old graduating from Mary Deb's pre-K program um, on June 17th, Father's Day this year. So he's going into the Whitman Hanson Performing Arts Center, which was very graciously dedicated to John. And they said, walked into the foyer, and they said to their mother, Grandpa's here. <laughs> and <laughs> Not to be outdone, the music that was piped in at that moment in time was It's Somewhere Over the Rainbow and It's a Wonderful World on Father's Day. We sort of lost it. Yeah. <laughs> so there just continued to be wonderful signs. And we just know that he's always with us. He always will be. Um, he had a tremendous influence on our lives, certainly, and on the people that he worked with. And I keep hearing from people you can go to that last one, the people who had worked with him who just tell me the neatest stories. And probably that's the best thing um, when somebody passes is for people to share their stories with you because you hope that people will understand how important that is that that person stays alive in their mind and in yours. And it just is a wonderful um, opportunity to have an exchange about the, the journey of life. Um, so. That is my story. <laughs> Even if you're not dealing with cancer, and I know many of you in, you in this room have either dealt with cancer or other terminal illnesses, I, I honestly believe that you can, every day, find some joy. And I also believe that you can continue to find and choose your attitude. And you can decide that you're either going to wallow in self-pity or you're going to be positive and look forward to the future. Don't forget the past, live in the present, mm -hmm. and, and look forward to the future. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate that many of you came in early and we, we um, have the books available for sale um, if you would like a copy. Uh, that was never my intention in writing this book. My intention in writing this book was to share John's spirit um, and to uh, let people know who are sharing this same journey, how you can be positive about it. And even though you're living under a cloud, you can still live your life. We were fortunate. We were able to travel a lot. But we were cramming in our retirement. <laughs> um, and we knew that it was going to be short-lived. But it ended up being five years. So um, that was much more in better quality than either of us could have expected. So I want to thank my sister Mary is here. <laughs> uh, my son, Chris came in, and my daughter Julia, my other daughter, has got, her kids are now 11 and 13, so she's still chasing around doing carpooling. Um, so she couldn't be here. And my dear friend Jerry and her mom, and uh, another high school classmate of John's, um, Joanne Tripolowskis, is here. Then all of my Y friends, a big support group from the Y, we don't recognize each other in street clothes. <laughs> And then just some friends from town. So I really appreciate your coming. It means a lot. And um, I welcome any feedback that you have. If you do purchase the, um, the book, if you wouldn't mind taking, giving a review on it on, the, um, on the, either Amazon um, or on Barnes & Noble, even though you won't be a verified purchaser since you purchased it here, um, it does help apparently for when, if bookstores will carry it, if there are a number of readers who have read it. Um, again, the target audience for this I see is palliative care units, um, hospice, 
um, cancer centers, and that's my goal next, is to start to reach out to those groups. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.